Hello, everybody. I'm Brian Ledet. Like the student has um, announced, I'd like to thank everybody for coming here, the students for organizing this, and Carpe Insecte for sponsoring this event. Um, today, I was asked to give you a little background about the um, ecology or the um, enzootic cycle of Lyme. So, hopefully, this uh, presentation entitled Lyme Disease in the North Country the bacteria, the bug, in our backyard. So let's talk about the bacteria, a little intro in the bacteria first here. The bacteria itself is Borrelia burgdorferi, sensu latu. Sensu latu stands for the loose sense. It's a complex of bacteria. Um, it, the bacteria are spirochetes. They look like a corkscrew, but they're actually a flat wave. Um, you can see the bacteria here in the slide. They're highly motile. They move around. They wiggle. They, they, they go. Um, there are actually 17 different species worldwide of Borrelia burgdorferi sensu latu. In the United States, Borrelia burgdorferi sensu stricto, meaning in the strict sense, is the most common dis disease agent for humans. Let's talk a little bit about the bug. They're actually not insects. They're arachnids. So when you call it a bug, it's truly not a bug. It's more like a spider. Um, there are actually over, si over 80 tick species in North America 200 world, worldwide, but less than 10 of them have been confirmed as true vectors for Lyme Borrelia, and all of the confirmed vectors are Ixodes species. Ixodes scapularis is the human biting vector here in the North Country. This is commonly, in the scientific world, termed the black-legged tick. A lot of people call it the deer tick, but there are a lot more ticks that feed on deer, so we as scientists have given it the, the term the black-legged tick. Let's talk a little bit about the tick because it's very important in the disease. There's actually three living um, life stages, free living life stages, the larva, the nymph, and the adult. And each, after each life stage requires a blood meal to go on to the next life stage. Let's break it down into the life stages. The egg is actually not a free living life stage, but they all start from eggs. This is a female tick and laying their eggs. So those are the eggs a female tick has laid. I know, great pictures, huh? So a female tick can actually produce up to 3,000 eggs. It does, if doesn't scare you enough, 3,000 eggs out there. Um, the eggs are actually produced after the female takes a blood meal. They need that blood to have the energy to make all these eggs. And when the, after the female feeds, it's important to note that they actually overwinter as engorged, as fully fed females, and then lay the eggs the next, uh, when the, the next season happens. Uh, after the egg hatches, you have the larva. The larva are very small, and they live in these large bunches of larva. And you can see here this inordinate amount of larvae here at the top of a leaf waiting to latch on to the, to the next host that passed by. Here I hope you can appreciate just the, the sheer size of them. They're, they're teeny. They feed on small, small animals. They have six legs, unlike spiders that have eight legs. But it really the most important thing, and lucky for us, is that the larvae are never infected with Borrelia burgdorferi. Borrelia burgdorferi has to come from feeding on an infected animal. Because if all these guys were infected, we'd be in a lot of trouble. Mm -hmm. So the larva require a blood, a blood meal to molt to the nymph. Every stage requires a blood meal. Many actually don't survive. L lucky for us, or we'd be all overrun by ticks. Uh, the next stage is the nymph. And here you hope you can appreciate this is the nymphal stage. This is the adult. So the nymph is still very, very, very small. This is the life stage that's implicated in most of the Lyme disease transmission in the United States. Um, it really goes undetected because of its just its small size. The nymph can feed on a wide variety of, of, of animal, um, but they do prefer the smaller mammals like the mice and the shrews. Um, they actually have eight legs. So the nymph, the larva molts and they gain, a, they gain a set of legs. So like the spider, they have eight legs. They actually have no gender. So if you're ever on Jeopardy or who wants to be a millionaire and they ask this question, the nymphs and the adults have no gender. Again, the nymph requires a blood meal to become an adult. The nymph can overwinter, just like the, just like the, uh, the adult female. So let's talk about the adults. These are the guys, you, these are the guys you're more likely to see because they're larger. Um, they have eight legs like the nymph and spiders. They feed on larger animals. They're bigger, so they like to feed on larger animals. They can overwinter. And we'll talk about overwintering here in a little bit why that's important. This is where they, they gain their gender. You have a male Ixodes scapularis and a female Ixodes scapularis. Males actually feed very little, if at all. They're only there to mate with the female to produce eggs. Both sexes mate, 
Um, they take a full, and the female then takes a full blood meal to allow for the 3,000 eggs. And the female actually dies after it lays the eggs. So after that, the female is withered away and dies. Here you can see is the adult female and the different stages. If you see a tick like this, it started like this. It just fully engorged in a blood meal. It takes about five to seven days. So you may not think it's the same tick, but it actually is. Let's talk a little bit about, generally about the Borrelia enzootic cycle. The enzootic cycle is how Borrelia gets around in nature, between the tick and the, and the animal. Um, what we have, we'll start at the eggs, as we saw. 3,000 eggs are laid. The eggs hatch into the, nymph, uh, into the larva, the larva very small. They feed on small animals. After that, the larva uh, molts into the, uh, the larva molts into the nymphs. This, these are always confusing. The larva molts into the nymphs. If the animal was infected, at the nymphal stage, the tick can transmit the infection. However, um, the nymphs can also feed on small mammals, on humans. If they're uninfected, they can pick up an infection at that stage too. Once the nymph molts, it turns into the adult. The adult can be infected. Um, usually in nature, we find adults are more infected than nymphs because they have two chances to acquire Borrelia in nature. And the adult can transmit uh, the disease to humans or other animals. Once the adult feeds, they mate, and the vicious cycle starts all over again. So how does, what does it look like in the transmission of Lyme Borrelia in the tick? Well, I've made some crude cartoons. I don't, you know... Uh, Knock me for these. I'm not an artist. So I'm a biologist. Um, and what we have here is an infected tick. And here we have its little pinchers and its uh, mouth parts uh, on an, a little gray blob. That's the animal. Um, here you have the brown is its belly, its mid-gut. And this is where the brilia hang out. The brilia are green. Um, not actually in real life, but in this picture they are. Um, here we have the two little oval circles are their salivary glands. And we'll see when, an, uh, when a tick starts feeding on an animal, they produce a, a, a blood pool. When the, when the tick starts bringing the blood, the, bur the Borrelia sense this in the mid-gut. They're pretty smart little creatures. And what happens is the Borrelia start replicating, and they just kind of increase in numbers. At this point, they get to a point where they can actually leave the mid-gut and get into the hemolymph, which is almost like our blood system. The tick has a hemolymph system. So here you have the Borrelia leaving the mid-gut. Only a certain number of Borrelia leave the mid-gut, penetrate into the hemolymph. We still have replication because the, the, the tick is still feeding. And a certain number of the brilliant and the hemolymph can actually go into the salivary glands. And this is where transmission happens. Once the brilliant penetrate the salivary glands, they can then enter the animal. And now the animal's infected. It's important to note that scientific studies have shown that this takes at least 24 hours to happen. Mainly because for in the first 24 hours, the tick is undergoing water regulation to prepare for this large influx of blood. They have to get their their water regulation right, or they would just explode. So where do ticks live? Well, um, areas like this. And it kind of looks familiar, huh? Everywhere around here. Um, because ticks are very susceptible to drying out, they like to hang out in the leaf litter. So um, in the leaf litter, we have what we call microclimates. So we're walking around up, up you know, I'm five foot six, not, not tall, but I, I experience a different uh, climate than if I put my hand under the leaf litter where it's moist, it's a little warmer, and that's where the ticks live. And they live down there until it's right to come out. Um, the, the best areas for ticks are dense shrub dominated, so old um, hardwood forests, because they produce a lot of, a lot of uh, leaves. If you think about pine forests, pine needles are very dry. They're not densely packed. And, and you can see the wind goes through them. It's not like leaves that start degrading and have this really moist layer underneath there that ticks just love. Um, some ticks actually live their whole life on the animal and never leave. Um, however... Now, not the case of the black-legged tick. The black-legged tick lives a very um, small amount of time on the animal. It drops off and lives most of its life in nature. So the microenvironment is very important for the tick to survive. Let's talk a little about uh, tick survival. How do ticks survive the winter? I mean, I don't want to go outside when it's, when it's 2 degrees. Well, ticks have to be exposed to that. Well, they live in tick igloos. And if anybody sees them, say... <laughs> I don't actually mean they build igloos, but if you think about it, these micro, microclimates are very important because you have a layer of this organic material that's decomposing, a layer of ice or snow, it's almost like an igloo. You can be in an igloo and be very comfortable, as a tick can be under, the, under these little microclimates during the winter. Experimentally, Ixodes scapularis, the black-legged tick, has been shown to survive up to three hours just exposed to minus, three, minus six degrees Fahrenheit and eight hours exposed to directly three degrees Fahrenheit. But those are not the temperatures they see in, in the microclimate. It's much warmer down there. 
So what are other factors known to influence the survival of the tick? Well, temperature is a big factor. And it's not just how hot it is when we're outside or how cold it is, but it's the duration of the temperature. Almost like if you have a really cold winter, maybe your, maybe your flowers won't grow until later on in the season. The ticks are the same way. Um, humidity, they need to be moist. So the duration of humid or not humid, humid weather affects tick survival. Photoperiod, which is light and dark. They, ha they have cues, like other insects, to when they, they advance to different stages or lay eggs based on the amount of daylight in the day. And then their previous host, what they fed on before, can affect their molting and their survival later on in life. So how do ticks find a host? Well, this is a picture I took actually in Queensbury of a questing tick, a black-legged female. Black-legged ticks use a questing strategy to find hosts, meaning they climb up branches like this, and they latch onto you as you walk by. However, other ticks use the assassin or a hunter strategy to find the host. They'll actually climb up your shoe. Um, these are the scarier ones, uh, I, I think, because you, well, you're in a forest and they're, they're, you can see them running at you. Um, <laughs> I had to tell my mom when I started researching ticks seven years ago that, Mom, they do not fall from trees. Ticks are not falling out of trees left and right or we'd be in a lot of trouble. Um, they, they get up in your head because they have to climb your whole body. So they're, you know, they've been on you for a while if you find them up here. Um, so again, they leave these microclimates when, when everything's right, and they climb up these, these uh, vegetation, vegetation or, stick, or sticks to grab onto an approaching host. However, each life cycle is different. So the larvae don't climb as high. They're in the leaf litter. The, the nymphs climb a little higher, and then the adults climb the furthest. They have the most energy. So that kind of affects what animals are, they're, they're feeding on based on the height. Um, they actually can detect um, hosts when they come by, and they use these little organs called haller organs. You can kind of see its little hook here when it gra can grab onto you, and this is a little sticky pad, kind of like uh, lizards climbing walls. Um, they, they detect carbon dioxide, our breath, heat, and movement. Very smart little creatures. So what kind of hosts do ticks use here in the North Country? Well, a lot of hosts. A lot of different animals. The larvae and nymphs feed on smaller animals, like I had said before. The white-footed and deer mouse, the paramiscus species. Voles and shrews. Red squirrels, chipmunks, and birds. The adults, again, larger animals like deer, wild canids, skunks, and birds. So wild animals and Lyme disease. Do, do wild animals get Lyme disease? Well, they get infected, but a lot of them don't show any um, disease symptoms. It wouldn't be good for the bacteria to start killing off their host, right? Because then the ticks have nothing to feed and it just wipe out everything. It'd be great for us, but not good for the, for the bacteria itself. Um, animals themselves are more, some of them are more susceptible or not susceptible to, um, to the bacterial infection. Um, ticks are more likely to pick up Lyme disease from certain types of animals, like the shrews and the mice, than from the squirrels. Um, and actually, another fact for who wants to be a millionaire, uh, deer are actually rarely infected, if ever infected, with Lyme Borrelia. So the deer are only there to, to give the female the blood meal to produce the 3,000 eggs and perpetuate the tick life cycle. These are really due to the different immune systems. You can think of how different people have different immune systems. A lot of animals have different immune systems, and they react to infection differently. Uh, many of the important an animals in a bacterial life cycle show very little symptoms, like I had said. It would not be good for the bacteria to start killing off all the mice because then the bacteria would never, would never be able to per perpetuate. So this is um, you know, a long-term relationship here. Um, this is a direct benefit to the bacteria and the animal. Ticks can't travel very far. You think about it. They, they only take one blood meal. They have a limited amount of energy. If we only ate one meal our whole life, you think we'd be jogging? We probably wouldn't. We'd be sedentary. We'd be doing nothing. <laughs> Ticks are that way. They don't climb very much because they only have a limited store of energy. They only eat once every life stage. So dispersal, the ticks traveling ar around, has to be from the animal. So if you think about it, and I think uh, this will be talked about later on, deer and birds, they travel large distances. They can, they can disperse ticks everywhere. But mice and shrew, they don't, they're, they're not going down the, the north way up to Montreal or down to, uh, to uh, Albany. So... Where are you going to encounter ticks? Well, again, this looks very familiar. Um, a lot of places. But really, anywhere wild animals are present and conditions are suitable for tick survival. Trail edges, animal paths, and forest edges. Why those? Because that's where we're going to walk, just like the, just like the, the deer. The deer is not hacking through with a machete of, in the brush. They're taking the easiest route, for, easiest place from A to B, just like we are. Um, so these trail edges is where the, the ticks are falling off and we're, we're going to encounter them. 
So you really have to be aware. When you're in these areas and you say, oh, this looks like a really great habitat, or I see deer tracks, there's probably ticks around here. You need to wear light-colored clothing so you can see these ticks. Remember, they take, they take a while to climb up you. So if you spot them and just pull them off your clothes, throw them away, roll them around your fingertips, smash them with your fingernail, just don't let them bite you. Um, you cover your exposed skin because a tick's going to get underneath your shorts and up and you're not going to see it. If, if it. if I had these pants on, I'm going to see them crawl all the way up and take them off. Um, use, repe use a repellent. Um, but most importantly, we need to do our tick checks. When I'm out in the forest, I am always looking down on my legs and I'm catching them before they even get close to get close to biting me. And I've been pretty lucky, knock on wood. So with that, I think I'm in within time. Uh, I'd like to appreciate, I appreciate everybody being here. Thank you. And we will take questions afterwards. Feel free to come and grab me. I love talking. <laughs>